The following presentation was recorded at the Buddhist Society of Victoria, Malvern East, Australia. Please visit our website at bsv.net.au. But uh, today we're going to, yes, have a look at the more kind of messy mind states <laughs> and how to um, deal with those. Uh, so I was trying to find a catchy title. So I, I settled for Buddhist mind state management. I've uh, used that in the past. Um, but actually, I know, you know, management is a bit of a kind of a modern term. I think when I was doing my slides, I had management, management, management everywhere. And I was like, oh, well, this is not a business kind of thing we're doing here. <laughs> so um, I settled for relating to mind states. Uh, which is actually, uh, I think, much more appropriate. Anyway, so I was here roughly a year ago, I think on the 18th of February, and this is basically a sequel to the talk that I've given uh, in the past. Um, I started covering the four great efforts, and last time we looked at the uh, positive mind states, at the wholesome mind states, and how we can invite them in our mind, how we can grow them, and how we can uh, encourage them. And that is really the groundwork that needs to be done. And uh, I also feel it's, it's much more worthwhile to focus on the positive mind states because they will very, very naturally uh, make sure that the unwholesome ones are avoided. So I do encourage you to uh, have a look at that talk. It's called uh, Virtuous Cycle, Vicious Cycle on YouTube. So you kind of have the groundwork. So now um, we are more looking at patching up a problem <laughs> that has arisen already or making sure we don't fall into it. So that means uh, we learn how to let be and we learn how to let go. So that will be the topic of today. Um, I will be spending quite a bit of time defining the problem. Uh, so please bear with me there. Um, because this requires quite a lot of wisdom and wisdom can't be developed that easily so we have to have an understanding of what we're dealing with because we can't get let we can't let go of things we don't understand that they're even there so um and i'm basically also just following what the buddha has been doing in his teachings he usually defines the problem and then um, gives you the solution so what are unwholesome habits. I've uh, taken quite a few things from the suttas here. I'll be just uh, also saying where they're from because sometimes they take these talks and just put the audios on um, the kind of, what is it, uh, pot bean or whatever it's called over in Western Australia. So people have access to that. So this is from Majjhima, Majjhima Nikaya 78 from the Samana Mandika Sutta. And it goes as follows. Number one, these are unwholesome habits. Number two, unwholesome habits originate from this. Number three, unwholesome habits cease without remainder here. And number four, one practicing in this way is practicing the way to the cessation of unwholesome habits. If you look at that, do you recognize some kind of pattern that is familiar? Hopefully, no, yes, correct, yes. So uh, the, the Buddha often uses um, this kind of framework, not just for the Four Noble Truth. So for the Four Noble Truth, of course, we, we first define what suffering is, then we find the origin of suffering, then uh, we find how we can let go, how we can make sure that it ceases without remainder, and then we have the Eightfold Path, which is leading to the cessation of uh, suffering. So um, he's using the same framework here to talk about unwholesome habits. So what are unwholesome habits? They are unwholesome bodily actions, unwholesome verbal actions and bad livelihood. So these are called unwholesome habits. You might notice that in Buddhism we have the three doors that we talk about. We have the bodily actions, uh, we have the verbal actions, and we also have the mental actions. You might be wondering, oh, where's the mind here? <laughs> and instead we have bad, bad li livelihood there. This is basically what flows out into the world. The mind is kind of inside and very often, or actually always, it goes through the mind door first and then 
flows out through the doors, uh, the other two doors. So that's, that's where the unwholesome habits exhibit themselves. And what do these unwholesome habits originate from? Now we're coming to the mind. Their origin is stated. They should be said to, be, uh, to originate from mind. What mind? Though mind is multiple, varied and of different aspects, there is mind affected by lust, by hate and by delusion. Unwholesome habits originate from this. So you might be also recognizing here, we're talking about the unwholesome roots here. Um, you might be used to the word um, greed, hatred and delusion. And the word used in Pali here is actually raga. But um, they, they're very, very similar. Lust and also um, greed have a very similar um, kind of way of, of, exp of showing themselves. Number three, and where do these unwholesome habits cease without remainder? That's what we're really interested in to learn today. Their cessation is stated. Here, a bhikkhu, or anyone else, abandons bodily misconduct and develops good bodily conduct. He abandons verbal misconduct and develops good verbal conduct. He abandons mental misconduct and develops good mental conduct. He abandons wrong livelihood and gains a living by right livelihood. It is here that all unwholesome habits cease without remainder. So again here, uh, we are not just encouraged to restrain or not do the negative things, we are encouraged to do the positive things, which is very, very important. I can't em emphasize that enough. And now, how do we get there? And how practicing does the practice, uh, no, ha and how practicing does he practice the way to the cessation of unwholesome habits? Here a bhikkhu awakens zeal for the non-arising of unarisen evil unwholesome states, the abandonment of arisen evil unwholesome states, the arising of unarisen wholesome states, and the continuance, non-disappearance, strengthening, increase and fulfillment by development of, of arisen wholesome states. So for the people who've heard my last talk, they will be recognizing here that are the four great efforts. So we've already talked about number three and number four. Today we'll be focusing on number one and two. So one practicing that way leads to the cessation of the unwholesome habits. Right, what are the four great efforts? So the first one is avoiding, guarding, restraining. Um, we have lots of fires here in uh, uh, Victoria, so fires are dangerous, so we keep away. As I said last, last year, when the fire rating is very high, we evacuate from our monastery, even though the fire is not there yet. Or we had a snake visiting recently. It was a very small, tiny baby snake. <laughs> it was on the doorstep when I opened the door. When Bulchunda actually told me, I was very grateful because I might have not seen it. And even though they're cute, and I was kind of tempted, you know, to take a picture and <laughs> tell the others about it, we know they're dangerous. And if we are aware that mind states, unwholesome mind states, are dangerous, please avoid them. Don't even go there. <laughs> One of my um, monks who is training with me, he, um, he learned some kind of um, martial art. And he was very pleased when he went to the first lecture. They told him the first thing you have to learn is don't be there. <laughs> so you never have to use your martial arts. Try to not get into trouble. Oh, uh-huh, I went the wrong way. Ooh. Uh oh, <laughs> technical problem. <laughs> We're all wired up here <laughs> with different things. Aha, uh -huh. yes, there we are. Thank you, I'll try again. Yes, there we go. So, the second one. So you see the wall there? That would be the problem or the unwholesome states. And so we try to overcome them. So we try to find a way below or around or above or whatever. But we're not just overcoming those obstacles we are also abandoning them. So that's the, the other step. But this, for me, is the most difficult one. So you really need a lot of understanding and wisdom to be able to do so. And then the other ones that we've already discussed, that is the development and the cultivation. So you invite the friends to your home. 
And when you have your friends there and you feed them and you look after them, then those unwholesome mind states, they won't even arise because you have friends in your house. And the last one is the maintenance and the preservance of the good states that have already arisen. Uh, that's something we often forget. And the uh, simile I use there is um, for you guys who might have some teenagers at home, you know how hard it is to tell them to clean up their rooms and <laughs> you have to keep telling them. And the easiest one is if they've done it once, really praise them, encourage them and make sure that they maintain it because the maintenance is much, much easier than actually bringing those states up in the first state, uh, first uh, instance. Wonderful. So uh, I've looked at this with the teens last year as well. And to kind of remember these, um, we've came up with a catchphrase. So the first one is let it be. The second one is let it go. And then we have let it grow and let it shine and let it show. A wonderful simile um, that I've kind of adapted for this is the simile of the, of the bus terminal. So imagine you um, have an afternoon off work or an afternoon free, it's a weekend or whatever. So you go to the bus terminal to have a bit of an adventure. <laughs> when you come to the bus terminal, there is different buses that come past. And the buses, they will tell you usually at the sign at the top where they're going. So if there uh, is a bus that arrives and it says at the top, misery, <laughs> are you going to go on that? Are you going to jump on that bus? <laughs> Hopefully not. <laughs> So that is the let it be. But as I said, we have to have wisdom and it has to be written on the bus. If it says um, on the bus something uh, like, like uh, something beautiful, I don't know if it says happiness, stillness or peace, uh, then you will, of course, jump on that bus straight away, hopefully, and, and ride on it. But of course, this simile um, is kind of quite simplistic there. <laughs> the, the mind states are often a bit more complicated. So what happens, sometimes you don't read the sign on the bus or it doesn't tell you very clearly where it is going. You so sometimes have different stops on the buses and trams here. So you don't just have the terminal station. So it might tell you um, um, relaxation or it, may, it might tell you, um, I don't know, enjoyment or something. <laughs> but um, if we compare it with, say, drinking alcohol or taking certain substances, they might give us a certain boost and might make us feel kind of comfortable for a little while, but then the terminal station of that bus is a hangover. <laughs> so um, sometimes we get on that bus because there is free booze or whatever, I don't know, <laughs> or something which attracts us. And we just realize when you're actually on the bus that uh, we are on the wrong bus. And the bus is driving somewhere on the highway or whatever. So we have to make sure that we push that button so that it will slow down on some stage. And when it has slowed down, that we can go off, get, get off that bus as soon as possible. And then hopefully walk back to where we came from or get a wholesome states bus into the opposite direction. Now, when there is a wholesome states bus, please catch it as soon as possible. Get on it and then also stay on it. Sometimes it's the other way around in wholesome um, buses and there is a bit of something that has to be given that doesn't look that nice. So there might have be, um, might be some commitment you need, which is a bit of, bit of work and maybe not that pleasant, but the terminal station will be contentment, will be peace. So I encourage you to stay on those buses as long as possible and to get a ride to the terminal station of those buses. Okay, so often the mind state, oh, no, sorry. First, I have some unwholesome mind states. So we know the culprits there. Uh, I'll be also reading them out. So it's on the audio there. For example, mm -hmm. hostile, depressed, self-centered, angry, greedy, lustful, proud, jealous, untruthful, obsessed, stingy, demanding, restless, competitive, resentful, lazy, and sad. I'm sure there are many, many more, but just kind of to, to get you started on this a little bit. And some of those mind states, as I was describing before, it's not that straightforward. They are 
either tricky or they are sticky mind states. And there is wonderful stories in the suttas that I also wanted to share with you to define them a little bit more in the beginning here. So Majjhima Nikaya 45 um, goes like this. Bhikkhus, suppose that in the last month of the hot season a maluva creeper pot burst open and a maluva creeper seed fell at the foot of a sal tree. There it is. Then, being moistened by rain from a rain-bearing cloud, the seed in due course sprouted and the maluva creeper's tender, soft, downy tendril wound itself around that salt tree. So the Buddha has other con uh, suttas. Oops, uh -huh. <laughs> what shall I say? Okay, please, yeah, <laughs> you take it away. <laughs> Cheers. So, um, the Buddha was also sometimes describing that the deeds, that the kamma is like a vast field and the seed is our consciousness that falls down and the rain is our craving. So even if there might be a seed and there is no rain giving the moisture to that seed, it won't actually sprout. But if there is craving, and it does, this is what happens. Then the deity living in the sal tree thought, what future danger did my friend see? Pleasant is the touch of this maluva creeper. It's tender, soft and downy tendril. That's sometimes what happens with sensual desire or with kind of pleasant mind states that are actually unwholesome though. Then the creeper enfolded the sal tree, made a canopy over it, draped the curtain all around it and split the main branches of the tree. The deity who lived in the tree then realized this is the future fear the other deities saw in that maluva creeper seed. Because of that maluva creeper seed, I am now feeling painful, racking, piercing feelings. So sometimes what happens, we get this hangover <laughs> or whatever it is. We get those unwholesome mind states and hopefully we'll be able to learn from them. So next time something similar arises, we get off that bus earlier or we don't even get on that bus altogether. The other story is the story of the sticky mind states. It's uh, the Samyutta Nikaya 47.7. It's the monkey sutta. Poor monkeys, <laughs> you will find out why. <laughs> Mendicants, in the Himalayas, there are regions that are rugged and impassable. In some such regions, neither monkeys nor humans can go, while in others, monkeys can go, but no humans. There are also level, pleasant places where both monkeys and humans can go. There, hunters lay snares of tar on the monkey trails to catch the monkeys. So if you have, sit, uh, if you have uh, read the suttas a little bit, there is uh, a lot of similes like this. And the hunter is usually Mara, is the tempter, is the person or the mind state that kind of um, deludes us in doing something unwholesome. Hmm? Here we go. <laughs> the monkey, monkeys who are not foolhardy and reckless, see the tar and avoid it from far away. So hopefully we are this smart monkey most of the time. <laughs> we see the problem, we don't get there. But sometimes the opposite happens. And what happens is, but a foolish and reckless monkey goes up to the tar and grabs it with a hand. He gets stuck there. But not enough. Thinking to free his hand, he grabs it with his other hand. He gets stuck there. <laughs> Oops. <laughs> Next. Thinking to free both hands, he grabs it with a foot. He gets stuck there. Thinking to free both hands and foot, he grabs it with his other foot. He gets stuck there. <laughs> you see where this is going. <laughs> and the last one. <laughs> Thinking to free both hands and feet, he grabs it with his snout. He gets stuck there. This is one really stuck monkey there. <laughs> and that's why it is so important to develop the wholesome states. So even if you get stuck with one or two or three of your limbs, you still have one left to pull yourself out with the positive mind states. So that's why we can't overemphasize those ones. And so the monkey, trapped at five points, just, just lies there screeching. 
He had met with tragedy and disaster, and the hunter can do what he wants with him. So that's what very often happens as well with the, those desires that we might have or with the addictions that we might have. It kind of feels pleasant. We're like, oh, you know, just a little bit of this or a little bit of that. It will be fine. And then we get stuck more and more. And after a while, we realize that uh, we are not in control of this anymore, that we have actually become the slave of our own cravings. And in modern days, maybe that's happening a bit more like that than <laughs> like a monkey who is, who is stuck to the tar there. Here, we can kind of go and say like, all right, you know, it's very sticky and the monkey, our oh, poor monkey, give him a break. <laughs> he just got stuck there and it's really hard to get out of this. This is not from the suttas, but there is monkey traps um, that I don't know if they're still used in Asia, but the monkey traps function like this. You take something really nice, something sweet, and you put it either in a coconut or you put it in a ter termite mound, or here it's put in a glass. But now it's put in a glass which has a narrow opening. So the monkey can see what's in there, is tempted by what is, what is in there. He puts in his hand, but once the hand is in and he grabs whatever is inside, he can't get the hand out. <laughs> And so even though he's not stuck, he is actually stuck mentally. And those monkeys, the, the hunters, usually they just hide behind a tree and wait before the monkey goes and grabs it and tries to get it out and get it out and get it out. And he's so focused, so uh, infatuated with what is inside that jar that he can't let go, that he can't think. So even though there might be another monkey telling him, hey, all you have to do is let go. It's easy. <laughs> he, he's not able to do that. So I found a nice quote from Sharon Salzberg here. All of these difficult feelings or problematic states are a problem because if we are lost in them, we get so separated from how things actually are. We are imprisoned by the force of the very feeling. I have uh, learned uh, that Sharon uh, actually had uh, a serious health issue problem last weekend. Uh, I didn't know that when I was putting this all together. Apparently she uh, is in good care in hospital, but I just felt it might be nice to kind of just reach out and share our compassion with her in this difficult time. She's been teaching for many, many years and helping so many people. So we hope that she can recover and that she can take a break and that the practice will be there for her in this very difficult time. Right, okay. Now let's get a bit more granule gr uh, with this letting go business here. Relating to unwholesome mind states, Madhya Nikaya 75. Magandya, the eye likes sights. It loves them and it enjoys them. The ear likes sounds, the nose likes smells, the tongue likes taste, the body likes touches, the mind likes thoughts. It loves them and enjoys them. That has been tamed, guarded, protected and restrained by the realized one. And he teaches the Dhamma for its restraint. So you might remember this monkey was stuck at five points. Very often when we have things in the suttas with numbers, they actually stand for something. So these five points, they stand for the five senses. And here we also have the sixth sense, the mind door in, uh, in the sutta as well. But now, how do we go about this? Take someone who used to amuse themselves with sights known by the eyes, with sounds, smells, tastes and touches that are likable, desirable, agreeable, pleasant, sensual and arousing. Sometime later, having truly understood, <laughs> that should be underlined about three times. Um, other translation from Bhikkhu Bodhi, this is from uh, Ajahn Sujato uh, from Sutta Central having seen as they actually are. So we have to have wisdom. Five things. Number one, the origin. Number two, the ending. Number three, the gratification. Number four, the danger. And number five, the escape. I'll be going into these things in detail and we'll be actually taking mind states and working with those five things to see how we can overcome them, how we can work with them. 
and that's also uh, with the sight, sound, smells, tastes and touches and having given up the craving and dispelled passion for all these things those beings, they live rid of thirst with a mind inwardly at peace so that's where we want to get and the steps are those five steps here and I'll be going through them now step by step relating to unwholesome mind states so Samudaya is the origin and the ending is the Atangama in Pali so what is the origin the origin basically means it is the beginning but it's also the source and Ajahn Brahm very very often uses the word fuel and it's a very good word because we can start to understand what it's all about so the fuel and the priming so these things come together and they create those unwholesome mind states so we have to understand where they're coming from to understand what the fuel is so that's one side of the story the other side of the story is the fading the disappearance and the complete destruction so we have to understand how we can calm those states down how we can make sure we don't feed them and then eventually how the picture shows there that we can burst that bubble and um, if we have wisdom then we can burst it very quickly if we don't have wisdom we need a few more steps to develop that wisdom that calm and that wisdom to do that so we have a few questions we can ask ourselves so this is the fuel this is the fire this is the origin here so we can ask ourselves how are unwholesome mind states created what actually fuels them what feeds them and what triggers them and then we get the fire brigade in <laughs> to fight the fires and the question there is what diminishes those mind, the mind states what makes them fade away and what makes them also actually vanish and disappear altogether that they won't arise anymore in the future let's look at this a bit more in detail uh, the fueling process the people who were here for the um, peaceful meditation day yesterday they will um, remember this so psychologists have this wonderful kind of concept of priming trigger and then overreaction so what very often happens is we get exposed to certain things and the stress levels they start to load <laughs> like on that uh, on the uh, picture here this lady's stress level they're loading 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 and piling up and what very often happens once we get stressed we start to worry we don't sleep enough we don't exercise we don't eat properly we don't meet our friends we don't reach out and that's the vicious cycle I was kind of describing um, last year that starts to operate and if we can't break that it piles up and up and up and up and up and up so that is the priming and then all that needs to happen is something small like this <laughs> a little little butterfly that is too noisy for this none on this picture here so we have to realize why things make us angry why we explode with anger or with pushing away or what, why we implode with depression with getting down on ourselves with withdrawing with um, um, having addictive um, mind states that we get drawn into that is all an overreaction what is happening is actually not that bad but the triggers and uh, no sorry not the trigger the priming the fuel that has been put there that's what makes it so huge so if you think about the fires again as an example here um, you know you have the fuel load in the forests and we try to clear that we try to to do burning outside of the fire season for example so the fuel is this piling up of wood and then all that has to happen is one lightning strike if a lightning strike happens by itself and it falls somewhere where there is no fuel nothing happens same thing with the trigger if a trigger comes and there is no fuel for it to catch then it won't actually catch and take off so our work is to reduce that fuel 
The other thing that often haps, happens is that we excessively dwell on certain features or certain qualities. Now I'm talking about the unwholesome negative ones, of course. So we can have something simple, something that is just, yeah, it's just a flower. <laughs> it's there in a, in, a, in a landscape that doesn't look that attractive, but anyway, yeah, it's, it's a flower. Now the question is, what is our mind state? How do we relate to whatever comes up? So we might be like this frog who really likes this plant, <laughs> or he might think, oh, well, you know, where there is a plant, there'll be a fly on some stage, and I like flies, so I'll be going there and waiting for that fly and getting all ca caught up with it. <laughs> or we are like this um, um, comic um, <laughs> person here. It's from the movie Inside Out, and she is the one uh, who... Um, uh, it's the disgust um, emotion. So we might be kind of pushing away and kind of going, I don't like this. Um, actually, it's just a flower. <laughs> but when we get caught up, like the monkey gets caught up with this treat, and we don't realize that that is happening, then we are fueling the process again and again and again. And that keeps the fire going. So it means like putting more fuel on the fire, putting petrol on the fire, getting the fireworks out, whatever, I don't know. <laughs> so make sure uh, you don't do that. So let's uh, have a look at the other side, at the ending and at the extinguishing of those mind states. Uh, I couldn't find a better word. I just uh, felt urge tolerance might be a good word there. <laughs> So we make sure, as I said before, we don't feed that fire more. And the simile, I, I felt a bit itchy myself just, just looking for the pictures online on Google and on Pixabay. <laughs> so we are itchy. But with meditation, hopefully, we have learned that not every itch has to be scratched. And not every itch has to be scratched in this way. Because if we do that, we make the itch worse. As I was saying, we pile on to the fuel instead of extinguishing it. So, please stop. Like in the bus, realize I'm on the wrong bus here. <laughs> Don't just jump out of the bus, push that button, or even get the um, emergency brake or whatever it is. Make sure it slows down and it stops. And that's basically what this picture here stands for, the clock. We often say, time heals, but time needs patience. So we have to be patient enough, we have to be wise enough to realize it's an itcha. It comes and it goes, and if we wait long enough, it will go away. And the most kind of beautiful simile that I've heard in the past and that really kind of got to my heart is when people were talking about suicide. Uh, if you are suicidal, if you're in a state where you just only see all the negative things and they start crashing down on you, if you can learn to have this urge tolerance, if you can learn that these things will pass as well, then you will be able to get through that state and come out on the other end. So when I heard that those bridges, for example, where some people jump off, all that you need very often to protect those people to not take that step is to put a fence. People can get over fences, but even just having that fence there or having a little sign which says, here is the helpline, please reach out. What that does, it stops the feeding process and it stops the process of getting caught up in your own mind states again and again. And it can be very, very powerful. So if you ever have uh, suicidal thoughts or something like that, please learn this. Please remember what happened in the past. Don't get caught up in that one very narrow mind state. Allow yourself a bit of time. Even though it might be very hard in the beginning, it does get better and better. And you get closer and closer to that light, uh, uh, which is at the end of the tunnel. So this is the first step. And it's a small step, actually, but it has a huge effect. So that's what I wanted to share with this one here. 
The other way of dealing with it, once you've hopefully, hopefully done the first one, stop engaging in that um, uh, kind of unwholesome mind state, is giving it space and relaxing around it. That's what I was also teaching during the retreat um, yesterday a little bit. So imagine you just give whatever that is, which is troublesome, a lot of space. So what I use as a simile there, it's like a sponge. If you really kind of cram the sponge together, make it really small, there is no space for water. And it's very, very uncomfortable. So you don't have to go right into that mind state or right into the sponge itself. But just go at the edges, go around it and start to relax around that sponge. And if you do that, the sponge will automatically expand. And if there are any wholesome mind states around, which we could say is the water that's around the sponge, then the sponge can suck up that water and get the energy back that is required. When you're in this very negative mind state, then you're completely out of water. <laughs> you're empty of energy. So when you relax around it, give it more space, then it can spread out. And with the fire, for example, even if you can't put the fire out, if you don't have the wisdom to do that, if you spread the wood around, it will still burn. There will still be the same amount of fuel there, but it will burn slower. It will be less hot and it will be easier um, to deal with. So that's another way of relating to those unwholesome mind states. And uh, you can even that, do that in the body. Oh yeah, I forgot to mention that. One, one simile that came to me is uh, in the past I would do yoga quite a bit. And when I started to do yoga together with meditation, I realized something very inter interesting. Yoga is sometimes uncomfortable because you're kind of stretching. And what very often happens, on top of that stretching, we add our own kind of um, tension around that spot that we are stretching. And it gets even more uncomfortable. And when my mind was relaxed and I came from that kind of mind states to the practice, I realized I could relax around that area and it would be less much, much less uncomfortable. And I would actually be able to go more into that stretch. So I'm not encouraging people to kind of <laughs> break their limbs or whatever, but just to use that as a simile to realize, uh, it's like what I was talking about before about the overreaction, that we have to certain things. So the trigger is the stretching which is happening. And the overreaction is everything else which is happening in the body around it. So on a physical level, we can learn that that, that is too, that, that too. And when we learn it, then we can take it across to the mental states. And the last one here is gaining. Oh, oh, yes, sorry, I forgot the next one there. Also, we talked about suicide before. So once you have that urge tolerance and you give yourself a little bit of time, once you start relaxing around something, the secret ingredient there is the kindness the kindness and the compassion that you have towards yourself or towards the situation. And that's what will loosen up the whole situation as well. Right, and the third thing we can do here is gaining perspective, which means stepping back a little bit and widening the lens. So depending on where you are in this picture, you will just be right under the flower, which is actually really small in the distance there somewhere. But if you're right under the flower and you're just seeing that big, huge flower <laughs> above yourself, and that's uh, like with addictions. Um, when I spoke to people who, for example, um, have a smoking habit and they want to get rid of that or they, or they want to understand it and let go of it, they were telling me how their whole life was evolving around getting cigarettes, smoking cigarettes. <laughs> so that's what happens. Our whole mind state gets so kind of drawn into one thing that all we can see is how I'm, how I'm gonna get the substance, when I'm gonna get it, when I'm gonna use it the next time. Another simile, when I was a teacher that uh, someone gave us who, who was t uh, working with those people, it's like with a piano. You can, t you can play two keys of that piano and you just keep on play, playing those two keys again and again and again and again. That's what happens with addiction. That's what happens when we're drawn into something. Instead of stepping back, getting perspective and realizing I have a whole piano to play with. And when I spoke to that one person and told him, just try to reflect about it this way. Do you want to be free? 
Do you want to be controlled by this mind state, by this habit? Or do you want to have the choice to at least do it less? <laughs> so that's what kind of happens with this stepping back and gaining perspective. And again, with people who struggle with suicide, uh, there was another wonderful story. There was um, a man or a lady, I can't remember, who, who were at a bridge or somewhere. And uh, once they had enough time to look around, they actually saw a person passing in a car and just smiling at them or waving at them. And that's what kind of gave them perspective again. So very often, as I said before, it's tiny little things that can have this big effect, but we have to create the conditions so that that can actually happen. So that's the three things there. But what is really required is wisdom, is this aha moment, and is this very clear, distinct understanding to let go of these things altogether. They will re-arise in the, in the future, you will get caught up again, <laughs> that's okay, that's just the human condition, that's what happens, but if we can develop more wisdom, more understanding, then we can get out of these states uh, when they do arise. And that's the next three steps. Oh, hang on. Oh yeah, I have another sutta there. Okay. Uh, relating to unwholesome mind states uh, uh, from Anguttara Nikaya 303. Yes, that's the next three steps explained by the Buddhas. Buddha. Because it occurred to me, the pleasure and joy that arises in dependence on the world, this is the gratification in the world. That the world is impermanent, suffering and subject to change, this is the cha danger in the world. The removal and abandonment of desire and lust for the world, this is the escape from the world. So that's the next three points I want to have a look into. So we have gratification, which is called asada, danger, adinawa, and escape, Nisarana, <laughs> Venable Nisarano, who was here. That's where he gets his name from. He escaped back to Sri Lanka. <laughs> <laughs> so, the gratification is what is sweet about it. What is the pleasure? Why do we fall for those states? Even though we might think they are unpleasant, they have something which grabs us. And if we don't understand why we're getting drawn into them again and again, then we can't learn how to let them go. Next step, we see the danger. So we realize there is a problem. There is a terminal station we don't want to get to. <laughs> there are drawbacks. And then the most important one at the end, but at the end, once we've done the first steps, is the escape. The way out, the antidote, and the cure. And basically, again, <laughs> That's the positive mind states that I talked about last time. They are the ones that will really pull us out of this mess. Good. So as a last little thing to hopefully have it practical for you, for your day-to-day -day life, I want to take one example. And the example is anger. That I guess most of us do um, uh, kind of experience from time to time. And I want to go through with you the gratification, the danger, and the escape. And I'm hoping that uh, we can actually do that together as a group. So I'll open it up and we'll wait for your answers. I do have a few answers here myself that I will offer at the end, but to also get you activated a little bit. So, and, and also to give you the opportunity to practice so you can practice that in your day-to-day -day life later to deal with those unwholesome mind states. So relating to anger the gratification. What feels good about the, uh, anger? What does it promise us? And why do we fall for anger? Any ideas? Yes? Correct. Yes, I'll just repeat it so everyone hears it. So we get a sense of feeling in control when we are angry. That's correct. What else? Sense of release. Yes, sense of release, please. Yeah, energy. Yes, yes, you mobilize energy, that's correct. Feels good. <laughs> <laughs> Anything else? Anger? Yes, with anger. Hatred. No, hatred. 
Or hatred? Well, yeah, I mean, we're just taking anger as an example. But what, what feels good about it? Yes, you're intending to do that, and it might feel good. Yes, in German, <laughs> we have this word, Schadenfreude. <laughs> and it means you're basically happy if someone else is unhappy. <laughs> uh, we don't encourage that. And also, this is just to see why it is pleasant, why we fall for it. But I'm not encouraging you to, to get angry, okay? Don't get me wrong here. Right, so I think we've covered most of them. So I have, we are brave and ready to act. So it feels like we are this warrior and we're going to save the world or we're going to fight for the good or whatever it is. We are very focused and we're very goal oriented. So what happens in a very narrow mind state and it really narrows down on this bloody one person or situation that uh, has done everything wrong or whatever. <laughs> so it can feel good. It can draw us in. We feel right and justified to act and to get really heated out about uh, heated up about this that's the righteous kind of anger that arises we feel in control yes we feel powerful and we feel superior we look for someone or we look for something to blame so we are projecting this energy outwards instead of dealing with what is happening inside and what is unpleasant we just unpleasant we focus it outside and anger distracts us from the pain which is actually happening. All the unwholesome mind states come with pain. But we've become very skilled to cover that pain up and not see it. Okay, wonderful. So now we know why we might be getting angry. What is the danger in this mind, mind state? What feels bad about it? Where does the problem lie? And what are the drawbacks with anger? Any ideas, please? Yes? Uh, you feel tired? Next one? Yes, yes. It's difficult for relationships. It can re ruin relationships. Yes? Anything else? Yes. Yes, there will be regret because we do things we wouldn't really want to do. Oh, the Dhamma school is finished. Okay. Bye-bye. <laughs> See you later. Your, your health. Uh, the health can decline. Yes. Blood yes. Blood oh, yes, yes, yes. <laughs> you get high blood pressure. That's good. Health is, by the way, always quite a good thing to mention. When you talk to people about their health, they're often very, very motivated to do certain things. So even if a food is really nice, you know, get this fatty, whatever it is, with lots of salt and lots of this and that, and then you get studies that come out and say, oh, this is very bad. <laughs> this is carcinogenic for you. And very, a lot of people, because they're concerned about their health, they will actually drop that bad habit and develop another habit and start eating more healthier food. Some people still won't, yes, but often it's an incentive. Okay, so let's see what I have put together in the past there. People get hurt. We had that. Yes. We act without thinking and regret it later. Yes. We tend to lose our friends. <laughs> and it is hard to have close relationships. If you are very explosive, you will see that the people around you start walking on eggshells. And they won't really be vulnerable, they won't really open up to you, or they won't really tell you things that they might think might make them angry. So, uh, yeah, it can be detrimental for your relationships, as was mentioned before. Uh, the pain does not disappear. It actually just get, which we actually just get distracted from the pain, and it does fester. And also, anger, like all the other mind states, they start to become a habit. And we can get into a... A kind of vicious cycle there which is uh, very unhealthy and very unhelpful good and number three how do we escape so how can we get away overcome and abandon anger what is the antidote or the cure to anger any ideas there gratitude. yes gratitude that's nice yeah loving kindness. yes the classical one meta loving kindness Anything else? 
Yes, yes, seeing the big picture. Good, yep, let's see. So, as I was describing before, taking a deep breath, getting distance from the situation or the thought pattern, we talked about that before, how that can happen. Then feeling and soothing the hurt, that was the kindness I was talking about. Really going inward, instead of projecting outward, seeing what hurt me, what is the problem there, can I be kind with myself, and can I speak up? Can I ask people, oh, this has really hurt me, can we find another way of dealing with this? But not with anger, but in a way um, that uh, just works for the other person as well. Because when we attack another person, they'll go into the defensive and it will be very, very hard to get them to do things. <laughs> if we're kind and just show them how we're feeling and try to find a way that we both get along, um, it can be much more helpful. And we care, we understand and we forgive. Uh, again, this goes in both directions. We can do that towards the people outside of us or uh, towards ourselves. Because very, very often we get angry, angry about things that are happening in ourselves. Like, why haven't I overcome this unwholesome mind state yet? <laughs> so be kind to yourself. Understand, care for yourself. And then we focus on the good. That's the meta part. We focus on the good in a person or a situation, not just the bad. So I'm not encouraging uh, you to kind of fly up in the sky somewhere and just go like, everything is fine. <laughs> there is suffering in the world, that is correct, but we have to have perspective. And the best simile that Arjun Brahm gives about this is the simile of the hand. If the hand is right in front of your face, all you can see is your hand. But your hand belongs at the end of your arm. And when it's down there, then you can see the problem, it's still there, it hasn't gone away, but you have the perspective. You see the people around yourself, you see yourself, and then you can actually handle the situation much better. And I think one more. Yes, that's an important one, and I hope that will be something I can give you into this week or for whenever, next time I come back, <laughs> to not take things too seriously and to always have a hint of humor. And Ajahn Brahm is just so wonderful in doing that. And when you have a bit of humor, then you automatically get distance from whatever is happening. Humor automatically creates a buffer, creates a distance, and will help you to develop wisdom as well. So it's not just humor, but in a combination, it allows you that wisdom can arise. Okay, good. So that's what I have to offer today about overcoming, uh, or about avoiding first of all, and then overcoming and hopefully also abandoning uh, the unwholesome mind states. And it fits in with all the four great efforts. So we also grow the good ones and we maintain the good ones as well. Good, I think now there will be time for questions. If there are any questions from the floor or online or both or... <laughs> yes, please, if you, if you need to go, feel free to go. If you have a question, ask a question. If you want to ask a question after we finished here, if you don't want to ask in front of everybody, uh, we will have time until 11, so please feel free to come up and ask it then. If anyone has a question, they can put up their hand. We have a microphone. Or information overload already. <laughs> sure, sure. Well, if there's no questions, then you have understood. Maybe. <laughs> <laughs> no, we've got nothing from online. Nothing online. Lots of comments, but no. Okay. Right. Good. So please develop the wholesome and don't get in trouble. <laughs> and when you get in trouble, don't get stuck. <laughs> get help and get out of it. Not in terms of get over it kind of attitude, as I was describing, lots of kindness, uh, put the right, right conditions in place.